John Vickers, busy man. Good to, good to speak to you again. Good to speak to you again. Any who thinks? Uh, I know the role you're in now, and I reckon it might be the answer to the next question. What What's your most? It may not be. What's your most memorable leadership position, and why? I am probably going to say this one, Hugh. Um, I was just thinking about it this morning. When I first got the opportunity in the army, uh, what, what it would have been, 17, 18, 18, uh, for, for a promotion and, and to take charge, I think there's some, the significance of that when you're young, you know, there's that realisation that, sheesh, this is down to me. Uh, and at 17, 18 years old, you know, the army prepares you for it all the time, but you tend to be on the receiving end of it. You know, it's that you, you learn by osmosis. You're not being taught necessarily to be a leader. You're taught to be doing what you're told. So when you start doing it for the first time, you occasionally, I had occasionally the chance to think, you know, this is all on me. Best to get it right. So that was difficult at times. You just have to get on with it. And sometimes you get praise and you're doing well. And sometimes you get, a, you know, a rollicking and you know you're not doing so well. You just have to roll with it. But you learn. And that the army has been like that for generations. And so... I think it gave me a fantastic um, understanding. It was when I always found it difficult when people try to quote to me, civilians try to quote to me what it would be like. Imagine myself in a military position. What would decision would I make? And I used to say, whoa, stop, don't go there. I wouldn't have made that decision in the first place. Um, the military for me gave me a fantastic grounding. Just as a person, I think it's given me a fantastic grounding. And the leadership bit, what the army, what the army for me did was... Um, form a basis on which leadership grows. I don't, th I don't necessarily believe you are born a leader. I think you might be born with certain characteristics which you can amplify and that makes you stand out. And maybe in days gone by, people with money or, or a class position, for instance, were assumed to be good leaders. But I suspect anecdotally, we could talk about no end of people throughout history just because of money and class who were anything but good leaders. Um, you know, from, from Nero and his fiddle all the way forward. But what the military did for me was form a basis on which you pick out the, the best bits of being. You know, you've got to be a good team player first, surely. You've got to understand what people are going through and why they're going through it. And if you can form that connection with people, then when you come, whether you put yourself forward, you'll have been in situations like that, Hugh, where you just have to put yourself forward. Somebody has to step forward. And what makes you do that? There's a confidence you get from having been in the military that I think enables people to do that. There's often scenarios when you hear about natural disasters or events, terrorist events, for instance, when you find that the, the people that step forward pro often have had a military experience. They might not have been necessarily in a great leadership position, but that, that confidence that comes from having been there just means that at that time they know what they're going to do and it's clear, concise, and, and you pull other people with you. And, and I think I've been able to take that forward throughout my career. I'm, I'm sure I'm still learning. And, and that's a benefit, isn't it? I don't think I'm there yet. I'm sure there are plenty of times I get off calls and think, what the bloody hell did I say that for? But at the same time, um, you know, I'm doing it. It's down to me. I have to take responsibility. I can't fob it off on other people. I might feel that other people, you know, you, why did you do that? But I have to take responsibility. And, and I did that as a, as a full screw. You know, it's down to you. This is where the buck stops. Uh, a sergeant once said to me, he said to, in fact, it was a platoon on a Friday night. He said, listen, guys, you've got to remember, shit rolls downhill and you live in a valley. And I thought, then why doesn't somebody stop the shit further up the hill? Why, why do we have to keep wading through this stuff? But it seems to be that that, that difference, you, it, that stuck with me. I thought, I'm not going to keep passing shit downhill. That's, that's just past the buck. Don't take responsibility. That's not leadership. That's management. And that's poor management. And I, I don't want any part of that. So this role now, I think, is a culmination, I'm badly saying, of all our experience. And I'm, well, you know the history of it. I'm doing this with the people on the ground floor. We might be building something, and I might be the face of it a lot of the time. But it's the ability to say, I'm sharing the pain. I'm definitely sharing the pain. But this is where we're going. And when you, when you have to make a different, difficult decision or, or stamp your foot, I'm not doing it because I'm separated from everybody else. I'm doing it because I'm right in there with them. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. You, 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 you've touched on learning there. We never, we never stop learning. We never stop getting experience. And it all, it, it builds into the, the, the character of our personally and, and those 
those traits that we have that we can apply in, in our professional life, whether you're in a, a leader or not. And on that journey of learning, quite often it takes mistakes to learn. You said it. You said it. I was you, one of the questions you sent me as a sort of prime for this was, you know, what's the biggest mistake? And I thought, well, there's two things. You know, I could probably we could be here all day, Hugh, of the litany of things that you get wrong on a personal level when you deal with children, when you deal with colleagues. Oh, why was I like that? You know, oh, why were they like that? But at the same time, I said to you a while ago about this sort of it was almost like a Buddhist thing. There, there is no good and there's no bad per se. There are just things we ascribe to them. It might be good, it might be bad. If you just thought oh, that was an opportunity to learn, you learn just as much from the good if you're paying attention as you do from the, the bad. Uh, and I, uh, genuinely, I'd like to think that, you know, for, for all the list that people will come up with me as a charge sheet eventually, say, so you got all this stuff wrong, me old mucker, I just think, oh, well, that was my life. Well, well, I can't do anything about it. It's done. I might, if, if I don't learn anything, then, then there's trouble. I'll keep doing it. Absolutely. And I'll keep being an arse. If I manage to do something about it by... You know, what did that teach me? Why or oh, why is that making me upset? Why is that, you know, why does that grip me all the time? Look at that and change probably me, not the other person. They've got their own battles going on. I've got to change me. Don't let it bother me so much or understand why it bothers me and look inside and say, look, you've got to get rid of that baggage. I, I try to teach other people. I try to teach my son that, you know, don't look at things as bad. I, you'll say things on a, on a computer game or he puts himself down. I think just if we did, if we all stop putting ourselves down so much and start just being a bit kinder to ourselves, I suspect it would rub off. That would be a better thing. So what is your most memorable mistake? What stuck with you? What has bothered you the most? This one probably. <laughs> this one. What, um, the decision to be on the podcast? Well, yeah, well, that as well. The second one, yeah. Um, no, this business, you know, I, there's, there's so many. I was trying to think of a, of a clear example where I think I've really, really, really screwed up. And there have been things, you know, even before I started work here as a teenager that I wish I wish I'd been able to rewind and not done. That, yeah, absolutely. Um, but after that, if you come to terms with those things, you just again they're done. What, I can't physically unless you introduce me to somebody who's got a time machine there ain't no going back so you can carry that rock around with me and I'm, i suspect like a lot of people i've carried lots of rocks and all they do is just just weigh you down eventually so uh, is it a mistake to start this business no at times you look at it and think oh, yeah well, this is you know is this just going to drag on forever uh, and you try and think these good things are coming and suddenly it doesn't work out the way you expected and that can be crushing so I, I suspect I'm trying to say I'm living right now. You know, what happens, happened. What's going to happen is going to happen. Now is the only time I can influence right this second. And every second that goes by, it's done. It's, it's for the re records now. So, I, I, you know, I, I genuinely have started to think I'm less worried about highlighting where I think I've got. We've all got that. But I'm only here because of all those things. So those mistakes must be equally important. I didn't get up the day my dad died. You know, we used to get up in the morning at breakfast at 5.30 in the morning every morning. I didn't. I would love to have rewound the clock and gone back. But because I couldn't, I have to accept it. But those are not mistakes, are they? You know, we, we're quick to sort of say that was a mistake. There's lots of things like that I think you can say in life. But if you took out the word mistake and it's learning, well, cool, crack on. Yeah, definitely. Definitely that I mean that's something I've come to understand more especially in the last few years, is uh, is exactly what you said there, mate. A mistake is is an indication is a good indication that you've learned something because I identify yeah. you've, you've, you've messed up means you've learned the, there's, there's actually a different path to this or a different answer to this. And it's not the one I thought it was. And you, and you grow on from that. You've got more knowledge. It's, it's not the worst thing to make a mistake at all. Well, I, I guarantee we've all been there and we've winged it, right? We've all given a lecture when we thought I haven't learned the lesson yet, but you wing the sort of, you know, uh, law weapons, number three, you've winged it and thought I'll get away with that. But, but that didn't teach you anything. You, you knew how to wing it. I suspect in real life, if you were in a situation where somebody was dependent on you and all you've managed to do up until that point is wing it, you're not going to last very long. Far better, you know, but we don't teach that. We don't teach that in school. You get it wrong. Sheesh, the amount of times I you know, was kicked out of class, going to stand in the hallway. I thought, well, that's not doing me any good either. All right, I shouldn't have been talking, but I was probably asking, some of the time at least, you know, what's the answer? How did you do that? 
and, and we, we get indoctrinated to sort of give our kids apparently by the age of five we told told our kids an extortionate number of times no no that's wrong instead of yes or or, or positive reinforcement and, and so it becomes like this mantra you, you nobody wants to screw up nobody wants to get it wrong you know you you remember, you remember the day in training somebody gets picked on you think don't let it be me <laughs> don't let it be me and then when it is you you're going to get it you know most of the time you you're going to get it wrong but we it's a poor way really of, of learning because surely learning is getting it wrong so you know if you once you eventually get it right you think right i, I know what the things i don't want to do are the old edison thing you know how many times did he invent the ruddy light well he didn't invent the light bulb, but but the, the, the filament and he kept going back and saying this will work and it didn't but he, he said i haven't learned you know i haven't made a thousand mistakes i've learned 999 ways of not to do something <laughs> yeah it's a good way to put it good way to put it business ways business ways what what can impact a, uh, a company more now noting that both of these things are important so what can impact a company more? A poor relationship with your staff, John, or a poor relationship with your clients? So we're, I'm lucky to you. I'm going to give you what I think. Actually, something Richard Branson, I read a quote of him. I'm, we, we have we've touched clients a little bit at the moment. You know, we've engaged with them a little bit. But if you haven't got a good relationship with your staff, and I'll go back to the military, if you haven't got a good relationship with your team, it doesn't matter how well you're kissing ass everywhere else, the people that are going to be doing the work typically <laughs> haven't got a motivation to do it with you. And so I think, and Richard Branson said that, you know, if you, if you don't get it right with your staff, with your team first, the rest will, will not follow. They'll be working because they think, well, I'll get a paycheck, but actually do I bother? Am I bothered with the level of customer service? Not really. I'll still get a paycheck. This is a rubbish job. The boss is always in the mood. I am always getting dumped on. Um, and so I, for me, it is about getting right with the, your staff and your team first, and then they will do your job for you a thousand times better often than you can do. There's more of them. Um, I, so I'm a big believer in get that right first. And, and that culture and that feeling should spread out from your company. People take ownership. I've noticed it with this. People who physically aren't working as well with us directly or are in other countries absolutely take responsibility. They feel like they own a part of it. I can't buy that. I've had to ask them to do it. That I didn't, in fact, ask them to do it. They're just doing it. That, that's it. That's priceless. Yeah, you know, that emotional investment in what you're doing, um, definitely. That's. I, I think that's what the people always say. You know, it's very hard to get the ideal to be in the ideal job and you know, find the thing you really want to do. It's it's because it's very difficult to get emotionally invested in, in the business you're a part of. And you flip that round in the same way. It's very the, the CEO as you are to get your staff emotionally invested in it. Do you think it's, you've worked in like, you've worked in senior positions, mate, in big companies and in small companies, right? Or smaller companies. Do you think it's harder to maintain a, a positive relationship with the staff in a small business than it is in a big business? That's a very good question. It depends really. The, the culture in a small business is, is closer to you if there's only Hundred people, fifty people in a company. You, you tend to be closer to the owner, to the CEO, the managing director by default. Even if you're the, you know, the newest joiner, you're closer because there's just less of you. And I often found it you had to, if you get on well with, for instance, a business owner and it's a small company, then great, you've got that natural affinity. You know, you can almost feel like you're talking for them. You know what they would say in a similar situation. When you get into a big company, you're never going to meet the CEO of, of IBM or, or GE typically, right? They're, they're miles away. So you can only influence your bit and you can do so seeing what other departments around you are like and you can sort of stride, stride out on your own with your own team. Um, of course, you've got to feel, fit in broadly with the culture. I used to find it difficult. If you don't get on in a small company, you feel it really keenly. You feel it every day. You know, if you've been, if you've got a posting or a, you're with a school section or whatever, they just know that there's just not a good vibe. It's hard work. But I've worked in some big companies and, and, and senior managers who I might have reported to, you just think, sheesh, you, do you ever hurt yourself? You know, there's a real sort of, they, they don't go down to the shop floor and engage with stuff. They expect you to do it. And yet, you know, you are you just know in your heart you're not you're not really giving the shop floor the vibe and the message you would normally give them. You're having to relay somebody else's up because they won't be bothered to do it. I find working for people like that, I found working for people like that, 
as I got older, I just got more willing to tell them to, you know, do one for me. Before I, and I did, I've told a couple of directors and managers, you know, just naff off for a minute. I might not have, have completely lost it with them, but just made it clear in an almost joking way. I'm serious, but we're at that point where it's not, we've not fallen out. So why do one of us needs to walk away? Yeah. On, on the subject of relationships, there's always the challenge in the question of the work-life balance. And it's, it's very often for, for people like yourself at the top of the tree, an imbalance, right? What aspect of your, of your personal life and your, your family life has the most impact on your professional life? And, uh, and on the flip side, how do you manage your family's expectations of you while keeping the pressure on in you know, the critical time that you're in now with, with Blue Abyss? That's another very good question. I mean, I don't think I would have been able to do it without the support. You, you know, there have been times when you, you, you just know, you say to family, I've just got to go and take this call and it's eight or nine at night. Or you're shattered and you just think, I've got to do something else. It's the weekend. And, and we were hoping to go out, even just for a walk. And you just think, I've just got to do this. I've got to get this presentation done. Huge impact. And, and at first, so for instance, my son would say to me, you know, Dad, you're always working. And I used to say, oh, no, I've got to. I've just got to. And it's very difficult, you know, because when he was younger, much younger, you, you could see it in his eyes. It was like he didn't understand. He was just saying something. But at the same time, you sort of think, oh, yeah, I want to do something with you. I want to get out of this. But I, I probably have managed to, I don't know how, again, because of my family, managed to stick at it long enough to think it, it's been a drag, but at the end of it, it will be worth it. you just got to persevere. you just got to, when you're going through hell, keep going. You just have to knuckle down. And, and at times, it just you, it felt like the horizon was getting further away and it's demoralising. So without family, in my sense, whoever's around you that's prepared to support, without those people supporting you, I can understand why people, you know, just say, this is it, end X, I'm out. Whether they just walk away from the business, whether they completely do something else, or sadly, if, if it gets too much for them, I, I, would, I would tell you now, I understand all of those positions. And, and how you get back from that, I don't know what it is here. I don't know what it is. Uh, a faith, a belief, an ignorance, a perseverance. All of it just seems to, I, I couldn't put a thing on it that you do. Sometimes you just need to walk away yourself and, and be emotional about it. Go and watch a television program. Go to bed and, and try and sleep. And the next May day you just get up and think, I'll start again. Yeah, Absolutely. John, I just I just noticed actually that in the background of your of your you've got a VC winner and I have also got a VC winner. So Ian, you've got Ian McKay because people will be listening to this. You've got Ian McKay. I've got Brian Budd VC for the next decades apart, which leads nicely into the the last the last topic question we're going to talk about, which is um, qualities of a leader. What, it, what do you feel is the most important, the most vital quality that a leader, a successful leader, not like a failure leader, a successful leader should have? That's a very, very pointed question. I think lots of people here will come up with lots of different answers. I was thinking about this again the other day, and I went on a card once, and we got stopped when me and this guy were out in, in London and asked by somebody for, a, I don't know, some, some question or other. And he gave a really, it was a really good answer. It was like, you know, a couple of sentences, whatever. And it was just one of those Oh, bloody hell, he nailed it. And the, and the happened to be a woman that was interviewing me. said, oh, fantastic. She came to me, and I gave like just a waffly thing. <laughs> I felt like I said, his, I'll take his again. You know, um, but for me, the quality that stands out most, and, and what Ian Ian showed me, empathy. If you if you are, can emphasise, empathise with people, then you understand their position, but... I'm telling you, I need you to do this. And this might not be comfortable. But you've built that rapport with people that says, if, if this goes wrong, I'll be there at the back pushing you up the hill, don't you worry, you know, to get you out. Or I'll be there with my hand to pull you up. And, and I think he, for me, Ian, showed that tremendously. Mate. If you've got empathy, and if people understand that you have to make a decision, they respect you for it because you've already built up that empathy with them. Uh, and so that stands head and shoulders above the rest for me. It, it can be a double-edged sword, though, right? I mean, we're in an era now, an, an era. We're in a situation now with the COVID-19 situation and the obvious impact that's having on industries across the world. Companies folding, and the companies that aren't folding, they're probably making redundancies. 
Um, and I've one of the things I've always I've never had to I don't think I've ever had to do it yet. Ah, uh, maybe I have had to do it once, and that is to let let someone go from a business. And it's all it's always something that frightens me the thought of it to be a person like yourself, a CEO, a managing director in a position where I'm getting told I've got to lay off a bunch of people. And that the thought of that because <clears throat> I have empathy. That's not me saying I'm a successful leader. But I have empathy, and I see it as a double-edged weapon. When I was serving, um, it was something like I could switch off. Didn't have the empathy, and yep. because it, man, your emotions can re- be a real bugger, right? Um, and what the thought of the what the point of making you is have that empathy with your staff, and then be in a position where you need to lay people off. Man, the drain, the impact on you personally. I mean, even not in a COVID-19 situation, people have to get let, let go all the time. Maybe they're underperforming. Whatever, whatever reason, um, you, you've been in positions where you've had to let people go. How would you cope with it personally? How you? Because that is, it's not a nice thing to do when you're a good person. Yeah, it's not a nice thing, Hugh. I think ultimately you have to take into consideration that if, if look, if you're letting somebody go, and I've been asked to do it on behalf of other companies acting as a consultant, and so maybe that was somebody else divorcing, you know, that they were going to feel terrible about. It. We'll get the muggins there to do it. He can do it. He isn't going to worry about it. And I, but I always felt it was a personal thing, as you said. I think you've got to treat that other person. They could be the biggest throbber in the world, but you've got to treat them with respect at that moment because their ass is about to fall out of the world. You know, oh, this is my livelihood. This is my job. Did you know? Do you know what you're doing to me? And you get all that. And I think empathy. You have to. There's a, as you say, there's a balance between sharing the fact that you're making them go through some pain. But at the same time, often, if they look at it rationally, if they get the chance to look at it rationally afterwards, they recognise you that it was probably, a, a be- they're getting a good opportunity. If it's not working out for them, and if everybody else is thinking that this, this individual's just causing us so much problems, then probably they're not actually happy in themselves. I've seen people who seem completely, you know, the thickest skin in the world, just don't care, and just want to come in and get paid at the end of the day, and you think, oh well, but for most people, they do recognise that it's just not really working out. And I, and I take heart in saying, this is not right. Either you're not in the right place or this is not the right job or you've brought the wrong attitude or you're just in a different position. But if they can go away and reflect on that, I always hope that, that, that you know, it provides them an opportunity in time to say, yeah, maybe that wasn't the right job for me. Maybe they weren't the right people. I'm better than that. Or, OK, I do need to learn these skills. So I, I suspect I've tried. To, you have to develop a bit of a thick skin, you. Otherwise, you'd cave in, mate. And you can't. You've got to be robust. No, oh, mate. That's a good way of. That's a. It's a good way of looking at it. There. Uh, a a, a, a re, uh, you know, It's a true way. It's not a way of looking at it, which is false. Just to try and make it easy on yourself to let someone go. But the 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 fact that if there's a reason that you that they need to be let go, or they need to leave the company. Then they're a square peg in a round hole, whether they realise it or not. And it could be, you know, that could be the the fault of the, the company's not right for them or they're not right for the company, but either way, it's not working. No, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see. And again, it, it's, it's a learning curve, right? It's just still a rubbish thing to do. Um, so empathy, empathy. I wasn't expecting that answer. It's a, it's, it absolutely, absolutely makes sense. But John, it's been, it's, listen, it's been a pleasure to talk to you, mate. Um, tell me, uh, is there anything you want to want to mention before we, before we knock it on the head? No, no, thank you. No, it's it's nice sometimes to have a chat about about these things. And then, you know, the fact that you can be honest today and say, whereas before, maybe in the army, Hugh, you're not always able to say, look, a bit of empathy goes a long way, or the fact that you're still learning. You know, you're supposed to have been at the top of your tree and, and perfect. And I've yet to find somebody that is. There's some very good people out there, but the, the minute you stop learning, and the minute you stop learning for yourself, then it game over, I think. Blueabyss.com. Blueabyss.uk, right? Blueabyss.uk. Perfect. John, it's been a pleasure. Good luck with it. Thanks so much indeed, Hugh. Have a great one.